just a, just a few minutes to um, to give a, a more of a prevention, public health, and policy type talk. And I'm you know I'm I'm going to go fast and give you a five to ten thousand foot sort of view. Um, you know this 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 workshop is really focusing in on some on some important issues around mechanisms, drugs, and 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 part of what we really need to do as a community and even much broader is advocate and get ourselves inserted into policy, into advocacy pieces and, and into prevention and management strategies in general. So just to give you some idea again, from a very US CDC centric view, since that's the role I play, um, you know, we really, hit this hard back in 2013 when we finally released an antibiotic resistance threat report in the US. And that led to actually multiple steps, including Cong our Congress investing $160 million for an AR solutions initiative here within CDC, which allowed us to then move things, certain things forward with states and, and with projects, and clearly from my bias standpoint in the fungal world, we did get some of that money, granted less than I'd like, but that's always the case, isn't it? Um, into the antifungal space as well. Um, clearly we continue to drive this forward and you can see here just some various milestones in different parts of the AMR strategies at CDC, finally leading again to the second threats report that came out in 2019. And you can see how these threats reports are then followed by the White House releasing a national action plan. And so we've now, we are now in our second national action plan because of the 2019 report. So in that report, there were some new national estimates, and, and you can just see here some of the numbers. Again, this is bacteria and fungi. Um, and, and you can see that we added five, or we highlighted five urgent threats, two new threats, and then we put three threats on the so-called watch list. And so just to focus obviously on fungi, we have two on the threats list, uh, drug-resistant Candida auris and drug-resistant Candida species, as you can see here, some of these numbers from several years ago. And then on the watch list, azole-resistant Aspergillus fumigatus. So taking on Candida auris, and you can see here the numbers in, in, in several, from several years ago, which are obviously dramatically different today, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a snapshot of that. Um, uh, we know this has been a new kid on the block, so to speak, and in a, a whole new way for all of us mycologists to have to deal with fungal infection spread that is in the healthcare setting. And so going back to principles of, uh, of, of the bacteria that spread in hospitals, uh, including vigorous infection prevention and control, is how we're, we're needing to, to help manage this organism. You know, I think the key thing that public health provides to this community is surveillance. And, you know, and unfortunately, surveillance is not common for many of the fungal pathogens across the world. Um, certainly in the U.S., we have very limited surveillance, actually. And a lot of our work is done um, getting reports uh, from clinicians, doing it in a convenience type of way. But one of the things we did, we were able to accomplish is to make Candida auris reportable several years ago. And I just wanna show you what's happened during COVID-19. I mean, you can see here that cases actually have gone up quite dramatically, both clinically and in our screening cases. And we know that being colonized with C. auris, we have at least 10 to 15% of those patients will develop or potentially will develop a clinical case. So colonization is a clear risk factor for developing clinical disease with Candida auris. Looking specifically then at our resistance changes, 
which again, we're able to monitor um, because we made Canada Oris reportable. I think you can clearly see here how resistance is, is, um, is, 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 is common with azoles, um, less so with amphotericin B, and still relatively rare with the kind of candens. Um, so, uh, so that's that's relatively good news. I, you know, I guess in the greater scheme of things, uh, although we know these organisms are, are challenging to treat, as we saw um, with Tihana's patient um, just a moment ago. But here's the concern, right? The concern is our number one treatment, um, a kind of candin. Uh, is 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 getting more orange uh, across this graph as the MICs are elevating. Um, that's a big concern because, as you already saw, azoles and even amphotericin B are more um, are, are 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 more often certainly in the azoles resistant, and even amphotericin B up to a third to a half of patients. So that leads us to the thing we've been talking about for a while, XDR uh, CORS or pan-resistant CORS, at least to the three current classes of drugs that we have available to us, um, not including 5FC, which can't, we all know cannot be used as a single agent, but, but, but hearing comments before agree could be considered as a combination therapy up front. Um, you know, we saw a few of these uh, pan-resistant cases uh, uh, over the last several years. Uh, certainly, the three we described with the with 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 with, with uh, New York, and these were all unrelated with no overlapping healthcare encounters, and they developed resistance to the echinocandin, the third drug, on treatment. What's concerning, unfortunately, and something we were worried about, is that we're investigating now more cases of pan-resistant. Canada Oris. These cases are related in environmental exposures. Um, they're colonized now, as well as just being clinical. And there has been no a kind of candid exposure, at least on those patients that are that that have these uh, pan resistant isolates. So our concern, obviously, is have these pan resistant isolates now become fit. We know that again, Cioris is showing us that fungal resistance can be amplified in healthcare. Um, and I think this now is an area where, where, where I've mentioned we mycologists need to focus on because of Candida auris. Um, COVID has created somewhat of a vacuum in, in, in healthcare for all of us. And no surprise, these MDROs, including Candida auris, are much more widespread and coming back into healthcare facilities where we had given some measure of control. Um, and we're also seeing them in new places like this large outbreak that we described in Florida last year in a COVID unit uh, that where our, our, our healthcare system with our long-term care facilities have been really a reservoir for these multi-drug resistant organisms, including Canada Oris and as we all know, COVID sent many of those patients to the hospital. Let's just switch and talk about the other big player, azole resistant afumigatus. Um, this is on our watch list uh, in 2019. And again, no surveillance for this organism, but we're doing some limited tracking, uh, more of a convenience. And let me point out that I know something that's already been mentioned, but and that you all know well, Unlike the bacterial or the bacterial resistant world dealing with food animals, where mechanisms of resistance created in the food animal environment are similar to those created in the healthcare environment, we have a unique issue here in the fungal world. And that is the patient route for creating azole antifungal resistance um, is one route, but it creates mechanisms that are not created in the environmental route of, uh, of, of, of uh, producing azole resistance using azole fungicides. And so those unique signatures, those unique mutations in the environment can then be tracked into patients. And we know then where that resistance is coming from. Unlike, you know, in the 
many for decades we've been talking about the bacterial world in food animals. So this is unique and we need to take advantage of this in understanding source. Obviously Europe has well documented this phenomenon now for a while. Um, in the United States, we thought we should look at azole fungicide use and lo and behold, in the last decade or so, we've seen a four-fold increase in the amount used. Interestingly, in the earlier 90s and 2000s, most of that use is, was in grapes and orchards. Um, however, recently, as you can see, row crops, especially wheat, corn, and soybeans, have been where that use has been going up. And you can see that the two major players in this area are triazole compounds that we know are similar to those used in human medicine. One of the few ways we're trying to look at this and I, is, is it by establishing this AR lab network where they, we have seven labs across the country. And you can see that we're doing large numbers now of fungal uh, isolates and characterization, even moving towards sequencing. Uh, and this includes looking now at, at, at azole resistant Aspergillus fumigatus. The public is one of our biggest audiences, as we all know, and I think the common perception of a fungal infection is off the athlete's foot, jock itch, um, tinea, uh, ringworm, etc. cetera. Uh, so we need to do better job in communicating that. And I think messaging for the general public that we all have a role to play should be combined with these sort of messages that are already out there for AMR um, uh, in infections. Let's include ourselves in the AMR world, not silo ourselves into a specific antifungal world. And so, you know, that's part of what I think the real challenge is for us is to message with, let's be included with the, the well-established bacterial plans and goals. And you can see here our uh, carb action plan that's, that's, that's 2.0 that's coming out um, over these next uh, four years. And, 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 and we know that these efforts are, 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 are able to make a difference. Public health interventions, you can measure the impact. And so we need to increase, increasingly include ourselves in these overall programs combating AMR. Um, so I always put a slide like this up that antifungals are antimicrobials too. And so when we're talking AMR, we need to make sure that we as a community um, advocate for the inclusion always of antifungal resistance in that talk. But, but, I, but I would say not speaking of antifungal resistance as much at least in in, you know, from the public health and policy perspective as a separate entity, but just simply including it in already good plans and the bacterial community have moved those forward, including fungal AMR into that discussion. So that's the way to work is across this sort of one health um, a problem where the environment, travel, community, et cetera, come in and, and play a role. So thanks, um, and, 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 and I hope I wasn't too long-winded, but thanks for letting me um, engage uh, today in this great conference, and back over to you, Neil. John, thanks very much. Always a very passionate advocate for medical mycology and showing great leadership there. Uh, I think that's something that we all recognize as important. I just might tip my cap here to also the great work of Gaffey and Life, for example, done uh, headed by David Denning in this capacity, which has been quite transformational and has really helped uh, in some very specific ways as well. Absolutely critical. 